Hi, Tony. Uh, welcome to the Let's Talk Digital Marketing podcast. Morning, sir. How are you today? Yeah, I'm very good. Very good. And you're looking very well. Yeah, no, I've just been for a, a walk with my dog, which is always really useful uh, on both the mental and physical health side of things. Get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, a good, a good advice. Good advice. Uh, so, um, yeah, so where should we start? Actually, one thing I found interesting, because um, it's Tony K. Silver, isn't it? Yeah. And there is a reason why you use the K in it, Tony. Yes, th there is a reason. It doesn't mean I want to be American. Um, <laughs> that would be a very poor reason. Uh, no, it was, a, it was a lady, and I'll, I'll give her a shout out, a lady called Amanda C. Watts, uh, who was doing a presentation a couple of years ago. And I go, why did you use a C? You know, because she's very English. And she said, well, actually, it just separates her uh, from the other Amanda Watts, which is probably more common a name than Tony Silver is. I thought, wait a second. So I heated my middle name. I, I inserted it into the, uh, Googled it, checked it on LinkedIn. It's the only person in the world with that particular name. So if I say to people, if you want to find me on LinkedIn, Tony K. Silver, you can't not find me because I'm the only one. And, you know, that's... Uh, all puts me on, I think, the first four pages on Google as well. So it's really quite useful. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a great tip to start with. I mean, even in your name, you're practicing what you're preaching. Yeah, as I say, if you've got, you got, know, yeah, if you're Dave Smith, my condolences, but no, obviously there's lots of Dave Smiths <laughs> around. Uh, but yeah, if you put that middle letter in there, there's more chance of people finding you because sifting through social media to find people uh, can be an absolute um, task and a half. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and your your website is tonykaysilver.com, isn't it? Yep, so everything. I rebranded myself uh, this year, and hence all the sort of um, stylized Tony K. Silver that I use, but I also changed my URL uh, and everything else to Tony K. Silver. So email, everything is now Tony K. Silver, which has been um, kind of working with my marketing lady, said that's the way to go forwards. Um, people know you as Tony K. Silver. The old company was Solid Silver Solutions. Mm. What does that mean? What does it do? Yeah, too many guesses on that front, so we, we, we dropped it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, why LinkedIn? Why did you choose the path of being a LinkedIn guru? Would that be a, a good description? It's, a, it's, a, title, it's a, a title people gave me. It's not one that sits comfortably with me. Um, but if people wish to give me certain titles, that's up to them. I don't use that. I just call myself a LinkedIn expert uh, on the basis that, you know, I can say I've done 10,000 hours on it. Um, I've been doing it for quite a while. Uh, it kind of chose me. Um, initially, when I joined back in 2006, I was working for a company and the boss said, this is right up your street, Tony, I think you like it. Uh, unlike most people back in the noughties when they joined LinkedIn, um, uploaded my CV, I just sat there and didn't do an awful lot with it. Uh, and then... Um, for those of you out there that are old enough to remember 2008, we had a rather large recession and my job was a victim. Of course, I was in the job at the time, therefore I found myself out of work. So I thought, oh gosh, what do I do to find a job? I uh, haven't really been out of work um, for quite a while unless I'd chosen to be. I'm 48 at that time. I started at 16 and went straight from school into an apprenticeship. So that's 32 years of experience. No, actually, apparently, according to the recruitment market, I was just old. Sorry? Yeah, there's no ages in this country, ladies and gentlemen, but by God, there is. I thought, well, what do I do? Panic, you know, I need to find a job. I've got a house, I've got a wife, I've got to support people. So I found an executive job club. And cutting that story really shortly, they told me two things. You need to go networking, which is probably where we met, and you need to use LinkedIn. Use LinkedIn, not just be on it. Okay, right. Um, networking, I had no idea at the time what it was. Kind of found out it's meeting strange people in strange places at the time. A bit scary. Um, and it is when you first start it. The LinkedIn, uh, I went to an event where the LinkedIn trainer were, came on, blew me away with his knowledge, I stayed behind, and I asked him if he could help me. And he said yes, to my surprise. And he taught me all he knew about LinkedIn, which obviously is completely out of date because that was like 12, 13 years ago. But also introduced me to a group of LinkedIn trainers at that particular time. And they were there. If I, anyone out networking asked me a question on LinkedIn I didn't know the answer to, they would tell me. But also they would support me. No, no, I want to get a job. I need to get a job. Give me, give me a job. Give me a job. And 
I got a job with the Chamber of Commerce, but it kind of linked in, wasn't, didn't go away. Okay, I found a job, so I'd use it for that. But I was adding to my tribe, my connections regularly. I was going to lots of events still, so I'm, a, I'm an armed networker. And it just kept growing, and I found that certainly in the early days where I was short of money, shall we say, having been out of work for the best part of a year, I had no funds, I was doing something old-fashioned called bartering. And my LinkedIn knowledge is what I was bartering with. So it kind of just selected me. Um, but I suppose that the real, the last major thing was around about 2017 when I decided that I wanted to go and work for myself. I'd had enough of working for other people and therefore what was I going to do? Yeah, it was LinkedIn. I mean, it's the only thing that uh, made an awful lot of sense. Uh, and I worked with a mentor. So it was planned. Now, I know a lot of people over the last couple of years have had to change roles and jobs, et cetera, and I think it wasn't planned for them. Mine definitely was. It took seven or eight months to put it in place. I worked with a mentor. Um, and it means that I'm coming up to four and a half years. Um, I'm easily going to make the five years in business, which so many people don't do. Mm. Uh, because I had the luxury of having that build up and working with the guy who'd been there, done it, lost it all and got it all back again. So it kind of self-selected me. But it's it's a passion. It's definitely a passion because I get to talk to people like last night, Eaton College, a of boys earlier in the day, talking to Metro Bank about delivering stuff for them. So it's right across the whole range. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So um, when you look at uh, LinkedIn profiles uh, of your clients or in general, um, do you what mistakes do you see? when you look at the, the profiles? I look at everyone's profile. The most, I mean, it's, it, the everyone most common. Does. You're, yeah, you're, when you're, you're a network and, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, oh, should we, you know, should we connect on LinkedIn? It's a, it's a standard st saying we do it. We connect on an awful lot of people, but whereas they probably, I'm not being disrespectful, but a lot of people don't do much more than just do that. I don't. I'd go and I look at their profile and I go from top to bottom, I look at the whole thing. And, you know, if they are then happy to have a one-to-one -one meeting with me, which is really my whole point of connecting with people in the first place, is I want to learn more about their business, etc. cetera. Um, I do then point out what I do, but also give them some hints and tips, which are free. You know, if they never talk to me ever again, that's fine. But if they implement those hints and tips, they will start to see much better results on LinkedIn. So I look at everything, but there are certain areas around LinkedIn that I kind of concentrate on. Um, mm. I don't get involved in things such as, you know, um, which I know you do on the Facebook side, the advertising. I don't get involved in LinkedIn advertising at all or campaigns. It's not my area of speciality. And to be honest with you, I don't think it's that cost effective, whereas Facebook ads is. So mm. I don't tend to people... 10 people down that road. So there are certain things on LinkedIn that people ask me, then no, I don't get involved. If you ask me to run your LinkedIn account for you, produce content, I'm going to say no. I, I don't do that either. Uh, I can show you a framework, but no, that's, that's not what I do. Yeah, what I find interesting is that you concentrate more on the free version of LinkedIn when you're doing the training rather than the premium, the sales navigator, uh, and the obviously you said the ads uh, weren't really cost yeah, effective I, I, I'd agree I, with I, that I, I I kind of um I don't think I hope LinkedIn aren't listening um that the premium is actually worth the money to start with and I always say to people you know why do you want to because often people say to me oh should I should I go should I go premium I go well, actually you need to prove to me that you do and the chances of you proving that to me are pretty slim because why do you want to use it? Well, they come up with a suggestion. You know, typical one, oh, I can send emails to anyone on LinkedIn. Oh, brilliant, fantastic. So you can send an email to somebody um, who's got to accept it before they even read it. Um, they have no idea who you are. So it's really like a, um, a cold call. How successful are you cold calling people? They expect the same sort of rates um, on sending emails. That's not really. And you're paying £50 a month, whatever it is these days for that pleasure and there's a few other bits and bobs that i just you know, i just say well you can do it in the free version there's only one thing i found that people come to me and say they need to upgrade because of and they're right they do they do and i'll tell you now what it is and i, I don't agree to it is that you know they're running out of messages 
you know, they've, they've hit their, their message limit for the month. But I'm thinking, well, if you're sending that amount of messages, you're sending too many messages in the first place. I think you're just really being a bit spammy um, about what you're, where you're going about the business. But that is true. You, to get more of those, you do have to upgrade. But most things in the premium, no. Sales Navigator, different story. And uh, being a, a speaker, I do tell stories. And I say to people, you know, Mike, have you got a Bob in the office? Bit, well, who, who's, who's Bob? Well, Bob's this guy who's got a bit of time on his hands. He's, he's got to spend 10, 12 hours to learn how to use Sales Navigator. And then he's probably got a, a minimum of an hour a day to actually work on the output of it. Have you got Bob in the office? Because if you haven't got Bob in the office, the Sales Navigator will be that thing after six months you look at what it's costing you and go, oh, I'm not getting anything out of this because you need someone who's got that sort of resource. For a lot of people I speak to on networking, don't have a bob, in which case Sales Navigator is is pointless. It's a great tool, don't get me right, I use it. It's got lots of different filters, but as I proved last night, you know, I, I often do this on stage, is I'll get someone to say, I thought, what's the what's the, what's the job title of someone you know, you know, you, you want to research on LinkedIn and um I think engineering manager came up last night because one of the students wanted to go into engineering. And we went in there and I think it was 1.1 million or something like that was the answer. And I said, I don't think you're going to have time to go through that this young man, even though you are a lot younger than me, you still probably won't get to the end of it. And then I'll show them how to do it in the free version. I'll show them how to get to a small list without having spent the money on Sales Navigator. Okay, there's a little bit more research to be done behind it, but I still have to, even when I, I do in Sales Navigator, I get I put in all these different criteria. I still got to look at their profile and I still have to look at it. So, yeah. For me, for most people, those levels aren't needed. And when I train people, I also use other bits of software. I always introduce them to the free version because ultimately, you know, they're paying me money to work with me. Therefore, I shouldn't tell them they've also got to pay extra money um, to do what I've just taught you. I don't think it's mm. fair. Uh, so no, like very much around the free version, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I've, that's that's uh, my experience too with uh, Sales Navigator. You do need, you know, a full-time person almost to yeah, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm the benefits. quite sort of jocular, jocular around the Bob scenario, but actually, yeah, I'm I'm underplaying it to a certain degree, um, but most people don't have that facility at all. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've, got, I've got literally every morning uh, when I, get, I come to the computer, I pass seven, the first half hour is do Sales Navigator. I, I have to go through all the messages and all the, all the lead lists and all that. And, you know, um, I literally dedicate half an hour of my time every morning to get it underway. For a lot of people, they don't have that time. It's not really worth them doing it. Sure, so definitely. Sure. And what is, what are your views on uh, LinkedIn business pages? Are they a total waste of time, or do they have Ooh, some redeeming redeeming features? <laughs> um. Again, I do hope you're not sending us a LinkedIn. Oh, hold on one second. Oh, I do, do apologise. I just need to uh, get rid of that. Um, company pages were an afterthought. I think that's probably sounds a bit harsh, but what happened is the profile came into being linked in 2003 in America, came across to the UK in 2004. It was always the personal profile. Okay, originally it was more around the CV side of things, but it grew and has got a lot more uses than that the company pay sort of was tacked on and what most people did originally was if i went onto a company page i'd look to see who worked there and go and look at their profile couldn't really engage with the company page they have made the company page better over the years they've got what they call showcase pages so you can actually turn it into a little micro site if you really want to um but ultimately there's one one area that is kind of a reason why you, you need it definitely i think it's a tick box exercise for a lot of people it gives them the little logo at the top next to the company name rather than those little pastel blocks so it looks a little bit better but oh, the underlying thing is is that i say to people right company page versus your personal profile how many connections do you got as a personal profile so mike you know thousand is quite average sometimes it's less than that um sometimes it's more than that so, okay, and followers on your company page. Ooh, for most people, the answer is nowhere near as high as that. 
I said, mm. so you haven't got as many followers as you have because you haven't had the company page as long. Understandable. But what you also need to understand is that when you post from either one of those, LinkedIn sends it out to so many people. So everyone out there who thinks all their connections get every post they send, sorry, doesn't happen. Um, about eight to ten times more people will see a post from your personal. So if you've got 100 followers, it's about 3% of the followers to actually get to see it in their feed on three people. Well, if you've got a thousand connections, it's about 10%. It's, you know, it's a lot more. And for most people, that's the deciding element is the company page. You can um, get your employees and all that to interact with it. But again, there's certain ways, because as you well know, in the digital space, just sharing something is duplicating content. And most of the algorithms go, it's already out there. Mm. and therefore they don't, they don't give you any promotion for doing it so yeah company pages yeah have one don't spend too much time on it when i train people i spend 10 or 15 minutes just showing them the basic shell and say yeah you're now going to get a nice little logo at the top of your personal profile um uh, but i wouldn't waste too much time doing it. even when you go into posting on linkedin there's a little drop down menu which says you can change from your personal profile to post from your company page for most people it, it just isn't worth the time people are looking for people and that's never really changed. Sure, sure. So um, I've noticed uh, recently you get a um, opportunity opportunity to either uh, connect with a LinkedIn profile or follow. Is is it better to connect or to follow? What happens uh, is what was it about a year ago? Gosh, time now fly, didn't it? We're nearly October. Um, yeah, about October last year, they they yeah. launched what they call creator mode. Uh, creator mode was something that big fanfare around it on LinkedIn. Um, it was kind of like a shiny new version. And a lot of people got sucked into it. And in creator mode, one of the things that they did do, which again, exactly what you're saying, is when you landed on someone's profile who um, you're not connected to, who is in creator mode, you don't get a connect button anymore. You have a follow button. And the whole idea is LinkedIn were promoting people to increase their number of followers. But most people I know would rather connect. First of all, simple fact that connections see five times more of your content than followers do anyway. Um, but when they put that follow button up, it puts people off. And yes, they push the follow button and they hear from that person every now and again. And, but there's a follow button, but actually the other side there, there's a more button. Go and have a look at the more button. Press that little drop down menu and down the bottom there, it says connect. You still can connect with the person. It's just not very obvious. Mm. And when you do connect with anyone, please, 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 please personalize it. Send a note with it because ultimately the statistics show that over 45% of people will just push the delete button. It's not got a, a, a note with it. So you're, you're probably just wasting your time doing it anyway. But give people a reason. Why should they want to connect with you? You know, the only reason, any time I do not do it, is if I'm standing in front of the person at the time doing it, in which case they kind of know why we're doing it. Um, even if they're going to do it later on, I'll still personalise it, say, yeah, we met earlier at this event. You know, we'd love to connect with you, just to remind them uh, why. So, yeah, most definitely um, the creator mode was something that was a good idea. It also had, and I, again, I demonstrated this last night, you know, if you go onto my profile, and I'm in creator mode, and they see a little three-second video about where my headshot is. What's that all about? Um, it's called the cover story. And behind that is actually a full 30-second, full-frame video with the audio and everything. How do you access it? Exactly. One of those things that LinkedIn bring in, and then they don't tell people how to use it. So, and there are other areas of creator mode which didn't really, really work. The following was the biggest issue. Um, putting some hashtags at the pop that weren't clickable. Well, you know, you, you and the mark, you know, non clickable hashtags are a waste of time. They have now admitted they're wrong and they are going to replace that with clickable hashtags. Oh, and they are continually okay. adding things to the creator mode to try and justify its existence. And I say to people, have a go at it by all means. But remember, the most important part of it, it's a mode. You can turn it off. You don't have to have it on. The other thing that really annoys me about it um, is that when you go on someone who's in creator mode, 
apart from the follow button, which is so well connected, doesn't really matter. It sort of puts their feature section at the top if they've got one, but everyone's got a feature section, and then puts some of their activities. Then eventually I get down to the about section to learn about the person, which I kind of want to know at the start. And you can't reorder that. That's what it does. So it also, again, another reason I... The only, if, you, if you find my profile and I'm in Creative Oasis, I've forgotten to turn it off having demonstrated to someone. <laughs> Probably the only reason I've got it on. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, LinkedIn has a lot of features it doesn't really uh, tell people about. Uh, and it's dependent upon people like yourself to point them out. Like I know from my training with your good self, I discovered a lot of different features in LinkedIn that I never knew existed. Um, no, and it, it's it's very much the case that I, I say to people, again, um, from stage, I always do this, is that, you know, um, everyone in the room these days is on LinkedIn, whether it's in person or it's an online event. A very, I don't remember the last person that I wasn't on. So we've all joined it at some stage. Um, so who had, who had a copy of the uh, the manual and how to set it up sent to them? I sit there, tumbleweed. I never know one's ever put their hand up because they don't. And and then we'll talk about something that some of the audience won't understand, um, the, the LinkedIn algorithm. Algorithms sit in the back on a lot, a lot of different programs, a lot of social media, and definitely LinkedIn. And they basically, they affect the way that they treat your activities on. So they change it tinker with it regularly but there's one big change every year so that kind of for me uh, i say that well that kind of changes the rules around what they're doing wouldn't it be really useful if they sent you a copy of that rule book every year and of course they do don't they oh no they don't do they they don't bother so yeah you're not getting any help when you set it up and every time that they do change features etc you either come across them by mistake or you find someone posting about it or, you know, not being funny, if you're lucky to bump into someone like me who tells you about it, that's the only way you find out about it. So there's still there's, there's still things on LinkedIn, which I get quite blasé about. Oh, they've been around for a while, but people don't know about them. They've never mm. come across them. And it's it's because they don't communicate, um, which is great. It gives me a great job. Don't be wrong. If they told you about every, all the updates, I'll probably have a less, of a less of a business. But they don't do it. And... They make all their money on the recruitment side of it. Okay, a recruiter's license is about three thousand six hundred pound. They make loads of money on that side of things, so they're not overly worried. They get fifty quid a month from people to go to the premium and say eighty or pound plus uh, for sales navigator, but they don't really uh, worry about it too much. So they, they, they don't broadcast that often. And uh, yeah, I'm sure that I opened your eyes, and you're, you're someone who's actually in the kind of the industry, and it happens regularly uh, that I can walk into a room and tell someone something, and they've been on the platform <laughs> since the start and they how long will that be there tony oh only about two years whoa, whoa. yeah so yeah they are they are not good but as i say for me that, that's mean that i can walk and i i also ladies and gentlemen in um be aware just in case mike doesn't ask this question because he i don't think he was going to um you obviously got an app on your phone linkedin app it is completely different um to the laptop version it runs a different algorithm and everything do different things on there as well so don't just think um you're restricted by what you see on the laptop um, there are some really good little features on the app okay there's some stuff they try to bring in and uh, nick off other platforms such as stories off instagram which we told them wouldn't work and um, a year later they removed it because oh it didn't work so yeah but the the app's also worth having a look at there's lots of little bits in there and the one I use an awful lot when I'm in person is there's a QR code and scanner built into your LinkedIn app, which means you haven't got to take someone's grubby little business card off them. You can scan their QR code and straight to their profile. Please note you are not connected at this stage. It is just taking you to the right person. So no disrespect to Mike Sharp. I'm sure there's more than one Mike Sharp on LinkedIn, in which case you've got to sift through the final person by Scanning their QR code, you go straight to that person. You can then, standing in front of them, as I say, just push a connect button. You don't have to personalize it because you're standing next to the person. But again, it's all in there. If you tell me you cannot send a personalized request from your phone because it's not obvious, you can. Mm. So if you've got someone in front of you, again, go that more menu is really useful both on the laptop and on your app. Go to that more drop down on the more menu on that person now has personalized invite it's been there ages actually i'm not saying it's just there but so you can so you cannot say oh i didn't personalize the invite because i sent it from my phone it's not an excuse you can yeah yeah i 
yeah, I find with the mobile, it took me a while to find the features on there um, that are ob more obvious on the on the desktop. That's true. Yeah, yeah. As I say, but there are there are certainly things that you know you can't do on the desktop. You can only do on the app. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth getting familiar with yeah. with it. And some of the recent updates um, on the app, which are, are being rolled out. Uh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, LinkedIn cannot push a button and update everyone in one hit. It's impossible. It would break the internet. So they're rolling out. You often hear me, uh, other trainers, use that term. So they've got to take a time to roll it out. On the app, you'll now find that uh, when you do a post on the app, you've now got some templates built into it, um, which sounds quite interesting. There, I'll, I'll leave you to think you know, what your opinion of those are. I, I wasn't overly impressed mm. uh, about them. There are two other things. They've also allowed you to have stickers on them as well. Um, again, quite generic. Is it LinkedIn? Is it more Facebooky? The ones they have, Ali, which I think is definitely worth using, is that they've allowed you to put a link. So if you post something on your uh, LinkedIn app, you have now got the ability to put a link to a website built in, which is then clickable from the uh, actual post you put out there, which obviously if they view that post on the desktop, they can still click it. But that's quite useful. That's 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 out of the three things they brought in. That one, go and discover because that's quite useful because LinkedIn does not like you going away from their platform. Full mm. stop, end of story. They get really quite hizzy fitty about it. And there's even talk of them removing the ability for you to put a clickable link in certain parts of LinkedIn. But this particular case, they brought this in, so this is going to be safe to do it. So, yeah, I would definitely look at that if you haven't seen it. Because, again, why would you have done it? something that they bought in um, recently. But you might not have it yet, so it's coming soon. So that's on the mobile? On the app? It's on the mobile, yeah. yeah. When, oh, okay. you, when you push the post button at the front, it comes up uh, with the menu, and in there you'll notice there's templates and there's links and there's stickers as in the menu. Um, so you can play around with that. Yeah. Um, to your but say that I think the link thing is really useful because it comes up when you put it in there and, and gives you the ability to actually put any URL in there you want to. So you can actually point them at a website, which is, um, I think, that's the best of the three things, in my opinion. Yeah, great tip. Um, also, I mean, recently, or quite recently, there's been a facebook allization of LinkedIn, for want of a better word. No, um, I call it the, the link, uh, Microsoft are trying to uh, Facebook LinkedIn. I often say that. So, yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you there. Yeah, they do. And there's a lot more, um, I suppose, more personal posts on there than there used to be, which seems to be promoted by the algorithm. Is that have I? Yeah, I mean the the algorithm. I mean the, the biggest um, promotion that happened last year, which was an absolute travesty, was the the promotion of polls on LinkedIn. And if I saw one, so this happened late last year. So when I next thing I say will make a bit more sense is that if I see another poll about should I put my Christmas decorations up yet or not, yes or no, <laughs> um, because LinkedIn were promoting it, so they were getting that out to a lot more people. But it was complete vanity. It wasn't really any use at all. They do, yes. So, I mean, a couple of stickers, you know, and the templates, they're a bit, you know, Facebook and Instagram y. They're not really LinkedIn y uh, on the app. The personalized stuff, um, it's kind of come around. So, if we had this conversation 10 years ago, then stuffy old LinkedIn wasn't really for that at all. Um, it wasn't the sort of thing you should be doing. And I'd have gone, no, no, don't do that. Um, but nowadays, I say, actually, yes. But have a look at it. Over a period of 10 posts that you put out there, one can be totally utterly about your dog, your family, your kids. I don't really care. It proves that you're a human being because it did get a little bit stuffy LinkedIn. So that, that's mm. absolutely fine. It's really good if you can do the business analogy built into that post. That gives it really good credence for the business population as well. And also, you know, networking, social media, Ultimately, we do it because we want to sell, but we don't go in initially to sell. So selling posts tend to get. But actually, again, one out of 10 posts, we understand that you're in business. And to be in business, you need to make money. As long as the core posts, the seven or eight posts out of 10, are business-like, informational, discussional, 
then that's absolutely fine. So there's definitely more elements in there. It's the people that have gone too far and everything's a personal post. Um, and that means that an awful lot of people now, I don't follow. I unfollow them. So if someone's continually putting stuff out there, which is just not relevant to you anymore, but you don't want to remove as a connection because there's a reason to be having them there. Yeah, just go into them. Again, that more menu, push the unfollow button. It turns them off. Then you can turn it back on again later if you want to, if they you know they stop doing it. Um, but yes, it is, it is definitely not as stuff as it used to be. Is it swinging too far? Microsoft are always trying to promote it and we keep going, well, no, it's a business platform, stop it. Um, but there's an element to that. And yeah, I will do the odd post, which is not totally business related, but I will always put that business analogy in there. So um, they work really, and actually they get some really good um, Good scores on LinkedIn. Now, first of all, a view on LinkedIn, pointless. Okay, absolutely pointless. Don't tell me you've got 5,000 5, views on your post. I don't care. <laughs> it's about the engagement. It's about people making comments, people sharing it. That is where it really, really counts. And actually, another tip, when you go, um, Mike's put out a post and you want to go and, in, you know, you want to interact with Mike's post. The first thing you do is like is the first thing there. Don't stop at that, please, because always Mike will get absolutely no um no extra reach by doing that. You need to go and make a comment and it needs to be at least five words long. A, meaning, yeah, a meaningful yeah. comment. Yeah, I mean ideally about twelve, but I say to get the algorithm to where you've noticed that you've done it, um five words. So like and five words, um absolutely, but yeah. Lots and lots and lots of views. Vanity. Totally pointless. Yeah. And also, uh, you've mentioned an underused feature is recommendations. Social proof. Yeah. It's one of the ones I bang on about regularly. And I think it might be we are a bit British and we don't like asking. Um, <laughs> that could be one of the reasons. Um, but over the years I've been doing this, the average person has got three or four recommendations if they've got any um on average two or three years out of date what is that saying about a person mm. and actually when i work with my clients as, as might well well know i say i'm setting you a really high bar here i'm afraid get to 10 because when you've got 10 recommendations on linkedin you're in about the top 10 percent on linkedin so if someone's doing a comparison between you and someone else and that you've got 10 and Keep them nice and recent as well. You've got a few that are reasonably recent and the other person's got the statutory three or four and they're two years out of date. Who are they going to choose? It's mm. a no-brainer. Um, but, yeah, people really just, they don't they don't go down there and they don't ask for recommendations until I kind of point this out to them. And I say, well, you can get to 10. It's not that hard. I personally, I ask for about eight a month because LinkedIn shows you three. And then you've got to push the see more button. But I'm not relying on anyone pushing any more buttons on LinkedIn at all. So I'm going to make sure those three that you can see are going to be no more than six weeks old. So if someone does that in my profile, first of all, very proud of this, there's 230 recommendations on there in the first place, which just puts me in the top echelons on LinkedIn. But also the recent ones are recent, you know, September, October, is all you're going to see before you push the see more button. It just means that, oh, this guy might, must be quite good and he's obviously doing some good work at the moment in time because he's getting current recommendations. So why aren't you doing it? You put testimonials on your website, won't you, listeners? Sure you will. It's absolutely no different. This is where recommendations play their part on LinkedIn. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And what's your view of um, third-party software? Like uh, Duck, Duck Soup comes to mind. Right. Once upon a time, many moons ago, you joined LinkedIn. And you had to tick a box which said you agreed to the user agreement. I have never, ever found anyone, even lawyers have admitted to that they've actually read the bloody user agreement. They've just ticked the box and got on with it. Well, we all do with software. I'll forget that. Uh, can't be anything wrong in there. But in there, it clearly states two things that I bring up regularly. And I often post the terms on uh, LinkedIn just to remind people. And it came up again last night. Do you're not allowed to give your login details to anyone else? Okay, someone logs in on your behalf, LinkedIn have every right to close your account down, and they will. Okay, um, so that's a bad one. Yeah, also, it does say that you shall not use third party software. 
and of course that is one's the big bad scraping one so there were lots of people who were flogging scraping uh, software a few years ago which basically they were promising you a thousand new connections an, an hour or something like that. it was just <laughs> absolutely ridiculous and stupid um you know so you know as an accountant am i interested in a fishmonger in grimsby yeah well it's, it's a result but it's not particularly aligned with what you want <laughs> they stopped all that they've also reduced the number of connection requests you can send and yeah use of third party gives them a reason um and we often have this and people come up to me or networking and say oh God, we've invented this software we've reduced this software it gets around the problems it gets around the issue i'm going no it doesn't for a while it will but linkedin's owned by microsoft microsoft's a rather large company with lots of resources they will spot this and then the trouble is is that they won't particularly have a go at the people or well, they will but if you're using the software it's you that have broken the user agreement therefore it's you that will go possibly into linkedin jail if you're lucky that could be five or seven days that you have, don't have access to linkedin or they can kick you off and they had a real big purge back in the beginning of last year where between january and june 2001 they removed 37 million accounts of the linkedin wow because Lots of different reasons, but a lot of them are centered around well, it's a user agreement. You agree to it and you're, you're breaking it. So therefore, you know, mm. we don't want you on our software. Um, it was about six or seven percent of the actual overall total because it extremely grown over the years. Also, there was this boop, blip. We're back up to 855 million now. So, you know, and it's it, it does have three new accounts open every second. So you can join this, this this podcast here. There's lots of people have joined LinkedIn. So it's still growing. It's nowhere near as big as Facebook. But it's not the same as Facebook, and although Microsoft keep trying to, um, it's a personal professional platform. Uh, in this country, that means there are 31.8 million um, user accounts. And I always say the word user accounts doesn't mean that they're actually actively using them, mm. because that's half the population of the UK. And I'm never going to tell you, oh, yes, if you go on LinkedIn, you've got half the population of the UK. You're going to, no, 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 you know, actually, the people that use LinkedIn, I don't know about Facebook, but you'll probably know the answer to this one, is that percentage of people that are actually regularly posting on linkedin actually regularly posting is only one percent so you know it, it, yeah but there's 855 so it's still it's still quite a few people yeah yeah same with facebook and other platforms it's yeah, a I'm lower sure, percentage sure it is. and yes. elon elon musk even had a issue with twitter didn't he about the amount of active accounts or real accounts mm -hmm. on twitter a lot of those yeah. accounts were were fake yeah, yeah, and that's that's a lot of the fake accounts were removed from LinkedIn um, in that purge I had last year. Uh, it's a personal professional platform. Um, so again, one of the slides I used last night um, has examples of bad headshots. Mm. It's a headshot. It should be head and shoulders. So it's very similar to what you're seeing of Mike and myself on here now. It's only our head and shoulders because we need to be able to identify you on the mobile phone because two thirds of people access LinkedIn via the mobile phones these days. Okay, so we need to make sure that we can see it. It's a smaller yeah. screen, um, but I, you know, I still see people that have company logos and other such things in their headshot. Yeah, no, it's a headshot. <laughs> yeah, most people LinkedIn don't need to do much about it because most people just go, Bleh. no they won't engage with that sort of person because people are trying to set up a company page via the personal page and it's not right it's against the user agreement as well um, but most people just look at it and go no if they can't see someone's face then uh, i'm not really interested so having a 10 year old photograph of you sat on a yacht bottle of champagne and i have seen that one it's not a good idea yes or worse still no profile profile photo at all I came across one yesterday. I had no product, no no profile, uh, headshot, and no banner. <laughs> I don't know what level of engagement they're expecting. Um, zero is what they're going to get. But <laughs> yeah. brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so we're moving on now to the more personal uh, part of the podcast, where we just ask you a few um, not personal questions. You'd be glad to know, but more um, the show show what Tony Silver does maybe outside of being a LinkedIn expert. So um, my first question is, uh, what would be your favorite type of music? What do you do to relax? People... 
it's a it's a mix. I, I mean, if I if I go out, um, I probably put seventies music on because that's when I was young. Seventies <laughs> <laughs> and eighties music. You know, I'm a, I'm a massive Queen fan. Like obviously, that's the that's the period of time when they were really really big. Although they still are. Yeah, you know, yeah. So yeah, that, that's that sort of music I listen to. But I will listen to. I'll even listen to jazz and country and western. I don't particularly like it. Um, again, and I love some classical. I will put on the Planet Suite every now and again. Listen to that. Mm. So yeah, I'm not one of those ones that staunchly. I just listen to this. Uh, I, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm quite sort of um, eclectic. But yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, but uh, yeah, the greatest ever single ever released was you know Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. Full stop. End of story. And I'll never get anyone um, argue with that one. Yeah. Win. Yeah, absolutely. And the Planet Suite, yeah. Now, now you're yeah. talking. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yes. And what would you say was your favourite film of all time? Saving Private Ryan. I've watched that oh. so many times. Um, mainly because I get, I get immersed in it. So I'm one of those geeks that's got a surround sound system. And it really uses the surround sound system. And that first half an hour of them on the beach it, it's it's spine chilling when you've got you you know you've got the bullets flying over your head and it's just oh uh, yeah i mean it's not actually true so if you shoot a bullet into water it actually slows down it won't kill you uh, so a lot of those people that are being shot in the water wasn't strictly true but just the whole atmosphere and there's also a bit later in the film where there's a tank you can't see it it's in the background and it's rumbling into this street but you know when you've got the subwoofer turned up you can feel it and you're just getting you're getting quite scared because it's coming, but you know, yeah. So that one for that for that alone, um, and it's also a very good story. You know, about, you know uh, having to find this kid, and it's a bit sad at the end as well. So it's it's mostly emotions for me. So that's probably the one I've watched the most. Wow. Okay. I'll have to I'll have to watch that one. Uh, what is your favourite book? Uh, business wise, because I don't tend to read non business books, which sounds really boring. Um, I. Literally, I'm going to I'm going to lend this to someone. Um, it's uh, by Robert Cialdini. It's called Influence: The Art of Persuasion, and it's uh, it's a book I I've used for many many years. Um, you could actually use it for wrong things, but I, I don't. Uh, and it's it's just one of those one of those cathartic. But there's lots of them in the business world that are you know, kind of cathartic. The one I, I well, I've got here at the moment in time that I've I've read recently for a, a, a book club that I'm involved in is Eat That Frog. Mm. Very small book, right there. You know, Brian Tracy, very famous. Oh, but brilliant. actually, it, it, it's just reminded me that, you know, in the morning when I get up, I've got a sort of, I want to go and do this. I'm, I'm a list person. I've got lists everywhere and I like crossing things off a list. Okay, that's me. I love my list. I love crossing things off. So going and doing a couple of easy things first thing, you cross it. No, actually, hit the big thing. Take the big thing, I eat that frog, that big thing, get that out of the way, and then you know, because I think I don't know other people. I have circadian rhythms. You can look it up. I'm very creative, full of energy first thing in the morning. By three o'clock, I'm pretty flat. <laughs> so no point yes. in me trying to eat the frog at three o'clock because I'm not going to be really creative and I'm not going to really want to do it. So I do that first thing, and then I can tick it off a list and realize that all the other things on my to do list now are quite easily achievable because they're, they're little, much smaller chunks to do. Mm. That's that's a good book. Uh, yeah, definitely worthwhile reading that one. Yeah, no, good. Yeah, that's a good good book. And uh, Tony K. Silver, when he goes out to uh, dinner, takes his lady wife out for for dinner. What what would you what would your favorite what would your favorite place to go? Like a Italian or Chinese? <laughs> we. We often go, well, so my wife and I tend to be not those people that go away for long holidays. We have lots of long weekends, in which case we go and stay somewhere. And, and we like to mix it up. You know, I like a good curry. We've got some very nice curry houses around where, where I am. Um, I'm not averse to a Chinese takeaway. But I suppose, realistically, Italian food is my favourite. Um, most definitely. Uh, I do like my Italian food. Uh, and... I also got lucky that around here, I'm living in the Thames Valley, there are lots of good hotels and restaurants. Mm. Um, so I'm very lucky in that respect. Uh, we got lots of uh, Michelin star restaurants not that far away. Um, and I do, and I do like my food. Yeah, you probably can tell. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the, uh, I'm very lucky that the wife's got very much similar tastes. You know, we, you know, we do like our Italians, you know, 
will often enjoy a good curry. Um, pizzas, yeah, yeah, I, I, I just I swear they just like food, food and coffee. You know, you know, you're talking, you're getting, you're getting the fuel that drives twenty k silver. <laughs> is that um, I have coffee delivered. You know, I'm wow. a coffee snob. I actually, I have a subscription service where I actually have coffee delivered to me by a local uh, company, not one of these big ones like Pax and all that. I've got a local company I met through networking. And she said she was starting up a local roastery and I've supported her ever since. And, you know, um, she only uses small plantations. They actually run out of it from time to time, you know, but it's it's not cheap, but you know that, it, that the, the, they are supporting. It's all, all ethical and all that, but it's, yeah, it's nice. But yeah, I, I need... First thing in the morning, I, I need my coffee. Uh, mm. That's definitely so. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I can... actually, if I go, if I go networking, like we, you know, unfortunately, we've never met networking. If we go networking, and I used to run lots of events for the Chamber of Commerce, that was one of the deciding factors about the venue for me. Certainly, when I ran them, if I get across, I can't possibly serve that coffee to my guests. <laughs> would be a comment <laughs> I would make because it's not very nice and it's harsh and horrible. Take it away and redo it. Um, yeah, I was probably not very popular with certain ones. But if you go somewhere like the Cliftons and the Danesfields and the Cower Park that I have in this area, you don't have to do that, of course, because it's not much in the first place. So coffee's important to me, yeah. Yeah, uh, me too, me too. Um, so could you give like a quick description of the services that you do that are available for someone who contacts you and and just a quick, I suppose, synopsis of it? No, so yeah, say so connect Tony K Silver. That's where to find me uh, on LinkedIn, but obviously all over Google as well. I tend to work in two generic ways. I work on a one to one basis with people, and that can be anything from a solopreneur like yourself through to um, senior directors in larger companies. And I sit down and work way through the profile with them, having Zoom sessions and do videos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And like last night. I go and do masterclasses as well. So I'll go into groups, associations and companies and provide the masterclass to them. Can be found on stage speaking at local expos, et cetera, as well, because I'm a speaker and yeah, those, I have a few books out there, but the main two things are a one-to-one with someone who definitely wants their hand held through the process and also supported. So they start getting um, the advantage of knowing. And that's where this confusion to clarity certainly came from. Um, it's a bit of a marketing thing. But a lot of people are confused on LinkedIn, you know, not too sure what to do. You know, the other term I come here is frustration. And I just take them from that point to they're really clear on what they should be doing. And then the next step is that actually when they post on LinkedIn, they're fairly certain the results they're going to get. Mm. And that really comes about by imparting my knowledge. So, yeah, one-to-one, I do a, a lot of one-to-ones, but actually masterclasses, I can get to speak to more people and give that to more people in one hit as well. So it's a combination of both. But being agile, not personally, because I'm not that, I'm 62 for Christ's sake. But as a company, it means that I have a generic product, but I bespoke them down to whatever the client particularly wants. That word outcomes, what's the outcome you want from this? And then we'll, we'll work around that. Brilliant, brilliant. And I guess your favourite uh, way for people to contact you would be through LinkedIn? Yeah, I do have a website. Uh, it's now called Tony K. Silver, and it's the TonyKSilver.com URL. But ultimately, uh, the number of times I get uh, an email dropping that someone's filled a contact form in on my website, it's kind of like breaking up the champagne because it doesn't happen. People, where would you find a LinkedIn profiler? LinkedIn, and that's yeah. where uh, most people will reach out to me. And then I, because I also use LinkedIn as a kind of bit of a CRM, although I am just um, getting a proper CRM sorted out, is that you know every every conversation we've had on linkedin i've got the message trial right the way back when we first spoke so i tend to use it for that information as well um so yeah most people will want to go and look at your profile anyway so while they're on there um they will reach out and to say if you do reach out to me be nice for mike as well you know if you say i heard this podcast with you and mike yeah, we thought it'd be nice if we could connect. So you personalise it, but you've also told me where, and I can feed back to Mike as well, which I mm. think is very important. You know, um, so that again, I use it for that particular reason. I want to know how everyone's found me in the first place. I actually got spreadsheets that tell me all this sort of thing, and I did one. I did a, a live, a live yesterday, and actually, when I was doing it, uh, popped up in my inbox. Someone was listening to it and wanted to connect. So yeah, 
Um, I always wanted to announce, immediately tell the guy that, you know, who's running a session, we've already got one person that wants to connect with me, so this obviously has worked. There are more than the 10 people on the call um, <laughs> that are in the room uh, listening to it, so yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for being a great guest on the Let's Talk Digital Marketing podcast. No problems at all. Thank you very much.